to all of you for, for joining. Um, so uh, what Tish and I are going to talk to you a little bit uh, about today is this idea of advancing school staff well-being at scale. Um, so just in terms of the flow of the presentation, we'll start with a little bit of background and framing, um, and then we'll talk about what, what the research tells us, which is why it's so great to have Tish here because she knows it so intimately, uh, and what the research doesn't tell us or what we don't know. Um, and then I can talk, I'll talk a little bit about taking a social innovation lens to this problem. Um, so just in terms of the framing for those of you who don't don't know us, um, Well Ahead is a, an initiative of the McConnell Foundation. We're a private family foundation based in Montreal working nationally. Um, our focus uh, of Well Ahead is on the integration of well-being into K-12 education. Uh, and the approach that we take is around systems change and scale. So what we're trying to help advance is a, a move from really kind of one-off patchwork approaches. We know that there's great pockets of excellence out there. and. Um, our, our goal is to create a consistent experience for every child um, to, to be in a school environment that really supports um, and fosters their well-being. Um, as we've been working in BC since 2015, we also are doing a little bit of work in Ontario and are exploring um, Alberta as well as a third province. Um, some of you may know Malie and, and her work in BC, and, and we take very much an experimental approach. So um, we, we know that this is a complex problem and that there's no one silver bullet solution, and so we kind of try a lot of different things. We see what works, um, and we, we scale what works, and we kind of drop what doesn't, so we're, we're um, it's a, it's a very multi-pronged kind of distributed approach. Um, so over the past couple of years, and I would say very much so recently, staff well-being has been coming up as an issue um, quite a bit, um, both you know from the perspective of the mental health needs of school staff themselves, so um, the, the, the feelings of stress um, um, and the challenges that teachers are experiencing day-to-day uh, -day in classes, um, the, uh, the effect that that has on students, so the link between um, the well-being of the adults in the building and the well-being of students, um, and just the human resource consequences of burnout, so the teacher turnover and, and, and things like that. So um, it's an issue that we're quite interested in, and we're particularly interested in how to impact it at scale. So how do we shift systems to better support staff well-being? Um, I'm going to turn it over to Tish to talk a little bit more about the research and, and sort of concepts around this issue. So um, nice to be here, everyone. Um, I I became interested in this issue as a teacher. I was a teacher myself, and uh, I then I became a teacher educator, and I spent um, about 15 years supervising student teachers and teaching classroom management. And what became really clear to me after observing teachers for many years was that the classroom environment itself creates uh, stressors that we don't often pay attention to. Uh, and what we see when we review the burnout literature in, in teacher uh, development is that it's emotionally exhausting. It's emotionally exhausting because there are so many demands that are going on simultaneously and there's a lack of privacy. So it's really hard to manage your emotions in the context of a classroom. The other thing that happens is your attention is so outwardly directed because you're trying to monitor all your students while you're also delivering content and interacting with students in ways that will promote their learning, that you don't notice your own stress level rising. Uh, and so you, you're trying to keep uh, keep a tab on your own emotions and keep yourself under control, so to speak, while you're also managing this classroom and delivering this content. So it's very emotionally exhausting. Um, and what happens when teachers become exhausted is that they slip into what's called depersonalization, which is developing sort of a callous attitude towards their students, which is not a good uh, way to respond to students. Um, they become dismissive. They start to imagine that nobody else could actually help this child, so why can, how could anybody expect them to? It's, it's a way of, it's a very dysfunctional way of coping with challenging situations. And then eventually they give up and think they can't do it anymore. And in the U.S. anyway, 50% uh, of teachers are leaving within the first five years of teaching, which is um, causing serious problems, economic problems. So uh, to really explore this further, my colleague Mark Greenberg and I uh, did a review of the literature that was published in 2009 because nobody had really looked at what are the teacher social emotional competencies that are required to manage this very challenging environment. It's just sort of assumed that people in their teacher training become uh, 
able to, to function well in this environment um, without any special training. But what we found was that um, teacher stress is really problematic and that it interferes with these uh, other dimensions such as teacher-student uh, relationships, their classroom management, and their ability to implement social emotional learning programs, which we know lead to healthy outcomes for classrooms and students. So one thing we now know from the research, and um, some of this research was conducted by Kimberly Schoenert Reichel, who you probably know from in UBC, um, that stress is contagious, that when teachers are experiencing stress, their students pick up on it and it interferes with everybody's um, learning. We also know that depression is associated with poor classroom interactions, and this is a study that I conducted looking at a relationship between observed classroom interactions and teacher depression. We also know that promoting teacher social emotional competence has positive effects on classroom interactions, student engagement, motivation, and reading competence, uh, which is some um, uh, research that we've been conducting on care in New York City, which I will talk about a little bit more. So in order to support our students these days in helping them uh, manage themselves and manage their own well-being, um, we need uh, to help them. We need to model the behaviors that we're hoping that they will engage in. We need to help them label their emotional experience. We need to coach them through challenging situations and practice with them uh, self-regulation strategies. So um, those social emotional competencies for students need to actually be supported by teachers. And in order to do that, teachers need a certain level of self-awareness, their own self-regulation, and empathy, compassion, and caring. And what we now know from emotion research is that when, teacher, when anyone is triggered emotionally with a negative emotion, uh, it's very hard to be self-monitoring. It's very hard to recognize and notice the effects you're having on others. Um, so one of the things we've been working on in CARE is giving teachers that confidence to be able to do that. So um, CARE stands for Cultivating Awareness and Resilience in Education. And it was developed by uh, myself and Krista Turksma, who did the training in BC, and uh, Richard Brown, who's at Naropa University in Colorado. Um, and we were working at the Garrison Institute to develop this program. So the program itself um, combines, it, it begins with the understanding that self-care is critical to um, teachers' well-being and ability to function well. And then the program involves uh, emotion awareness um, activities that help them understand. It's, the intention is to normalize the emotional experience in the classroom and how it relates to teaching and learning. We do a variety of different mindful awareness practices and compassion practices. And we do applications of these, um, uh, this understanding to teaching through discussion and various role plays. So the most recent paper that we just published, um, we found in a sample of 224 teachers that uh, we saw reductions in psychological distress and something called time urgency, which teachers report high levels of. Uh, this is the feeling of stress around not having enough time and increases in mindfulness and healthy emotion regulation. And um, the classrooms were observed, and those teachers who had care, uh, they were weighted as more positive, and, and the teachers were more sensitive, and the students were more productive. Um, and these positive effects were maintained or increased over six months for psychological distress, mindfulness, and adaptive emotion regulation. Um, what we don't know is, uh, the interaction, you want to take over from here? Or? Sure, yeah. sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so, I mean, I think there's, you know, in speaking with, with Tish and, and some of her colleagues, I think what we've come to appreciate is that there is strong evidence to support the value um, and the impact of supporting teacher well-being, mindfulness, and self-care, and that, that that does have a, have a really good impact. Um, there are other things that we know less of. So, so Tish and I were meeting uh, on Monday with a few others, and what we were talking about is that there's this sort of dynamic and interaction between the individual and their environment, and there's less there's less known about how those two interact. So, how um, the organization the organizational environment impacts the individual. So, for example, you train a teacher um, on mindfulness, and then you send them back to a school, which may be um, has some elements of toxicity or um, other sort of pressures. How, how, how does that impact their ability to retain those skills? Um, as well as how do sh 
staff themselves shape the well-being culture of their environment. So there's less known about that dynamic. Um, there's also a gap in knowledge around what changes to organizational culture and work practices would effectively improve staff well-being. So there's a great paper which I, I'll send to um, I'll send to Kevin um, and and maybe he can circulate it. Um, it's a paper that um, Mark Greenberg did for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, um, and he points to this research gap around how to prevent or mitigate stress from occurring in the first place. So there's this idea of okay, well we can train teachers on how to manage their stress, but how do you prevent that stress from occurring in the first place. So what are the changes that we want to see happen in schools and districts? And then further to that, there's a gap in what interventions would influence or produce those changes to culture and practice. So how do we actually make that change? So there's a few kind of levels of, of, of the change process that, that are, are relatively unknown. Um, this is just a, a, a quote from that paper um, that, uh, that Mark wrote. So uh, I I, I don't know if I should read it out. There's a need for greater innovation developing and assessing the effectiveness of policies and programs to reduce teacher stress and improve well-being. In particular, there's a need for further testing of the efficacy of organizational strategies to improve work processes, such as reducing excessive work demands, increasing job control, creating more collaborative leadership, and building more effective school cultures. While supporting teacher mindfulness and stress management is one avenue, teacher work demands are high and have been increasing, and policy and organizational level interventions need to address this issue. Um, so this is this is an area that we you know that we have a particular interest in. Um, so we we think of schools as delicate ecosystems, and in the absence of any graphic design skills that I possess <laughs> to draw out the ecosystem of schools, I have relied on an image that I found on Google of an actual ecosystem, which is a, a really great metaphor, right, in, in that um, there are many, uh, many, many, many humans in the school, right, there's, there's students, there's teachers, there's, you know, there's custodial staff, there's administrative staff, there's, you know, there's um, principals, vice principals, so all of these individuals um, they're, they impact each other, right? They, they influence each, each other's sort of behavior and feelings. Um, there's also external pressures. So, you know, things like in, in our physical ecosystems or ecological, you know, environments, we, we talk about sunlight and soil. Um, even in our schools, there's foundational elements that are kind of external uh, or externally driven that impact us. So whether it's, whether it's policies or politics, um, you know, it, um, it, it could be uh, sort of dynamics between unions and government. Um, it could be curricular pressures. There are all of these other things that are happening. And so, um, and so, you know, rather than looking at one of those individuals or one of those factors in isolation, it may be helpful to kind of zoom out and think about this, this whole ecosystem and how do you, how, what are the different sort of leverage points um, that could have ripple effects? Um, so, you know, what are those leverage points that have ripple effects throughout the ecosystem? What are the supportive pieces that need to be in place without which those positive effects would be halted? So what are the what are the sort of barriers or pain points or sticking points? So, you know, for example, if I were to use the the you know the this idea of sort of training teachers that it's it, it it's it's very important to cultivate those skills around self management, mindfulness and self care within you know within and among teachers, but you know, if if there are elements of the school environment that prevent them from exercising those skills, then that that investment is not um, we're not getting the full return on that investment. So, you know, thinking about sort of the supportive pieces in the environment, um, and how far out does the ecosystem extend? The district, the province. Um, what do we do in the face of such complexity? So it's you know it's it's easier to think of things in simple terms, and sometimes that's what we need to do. Um, so what is that balance between appreciating the complexity of interactions and dynamics um, that occur in our, in our reality, um, and the simplicity that we need to actually take action. So that complexity can be really paralyzing if we, if we think too much about it. So what are things that we can just do now um, and, 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 and try out? Um, so, what we've been thinking about, and we just kind of wanted to to um, share with you and get your opinion on, is this idea of a sort of social lab on staff well-being. So we recognize that this is, you know, and we've we've been speaking to 
researchers, experts, practitioners, professional associations about this for some time, and there doesn't um, there's a, an express need um, and concern around this, this issue, and relatively less concrete ideas that this if we just did this, we could prevent teacher stress from occurring. So there. Um, um, there may be some value in bringing these multiple perspectives together to actually really further explore the problem and surface solutions. So um, what, what we're interested in is having the guiding question be, how can we positively impact staff well-being at scale? So if the initial problem orientation is scale, would that result in different solutions? So um, would it, would it um, force us to think systemically and to think about systemic levers and solutions um, to, to prevent or mitigate stress. Um, we're also interested in, you know, are teachers the key target or do we want to target other adults in the building, other staff, um, or, also, you know, or is the purpose really that we are, you know, we're targeting other adults in order to ultimately influence teachers who ultimately influence students. So there's there's some fuzziness around how we think about what's the kind of theory of change here. Um, what we are looking at doing is, you know, with a, a, a social innovation lab, for, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's a, an, an opportunity to really kind of bring, bring um, a, a diverse group together to explore the problem, surface solutions, and then to actually test those. So there would be already funding available to put those ideas into practice, so pre-existing prototyping fund. Um, and and uh, Tish and I have already begun talking um, about the research and data collection. So how can we embed, um, embed uh, research into those prototypes so that we can say confidently that something is promising? Um, so we don't want to sort of burden them too much with a heavy, a heavy um, research protocol, but we do want to be able to say more than just anecdotally, this is, this is, there's something here that's worth further exploration, and then maybe going on to further research from, from then on. Um, so it's really sort of a light touch and reflective approach. So, um, you know, if, when we think about this, it's this idea of low attachment, so you're not putting all of your eggs into one basket. It's not saying, okay, well, we have come together and we think that this is what we need to do, and then, and then you, you kind of get yourself on a track of a plan. So we're going to do this, and then you automatically assume that you're going to keep doing more of it. It allows you to kind of spread your eggs among uh, multiple baskets um, and to just observe what's happening and, and, and um, be really reflective about what's working. And um, that maybe is a key differentiator from, from a, a pilot. So a pilot versus a prototype is that the scaling is the intention from the, from the outset. So it's not, you know, it's not just an a one-off thing. Um, so, you know, just to conclude, and, and we can open it up to questions from here. Um, I, I mean, we've talked to you a little bit about the research and, um, and and some ideas that we have, but I think you know the framing that we were given is what, how can how can principles support you know staff well-being? And I think it's just spoken about one example of a program that you know that does nurture these these skills amongst teachers, so you can open teachers up to opportunities like this. Um, you can learn these skills yourself. So I think that metaphor of, you know, put your oxygen mask on first is a really interesting one in, in terms of, you know, principles being the gateway, the gate, you know, and, and the setters of school culture. And I think if, if you as school leaders are able to practice self-care and, and work-life balance and, and um, you you can then, you know, you open the doors for other other staff in the building to do so and, and to develop those cultures of well-being. And and that's sort of the last point is, is looking for ways to create a culture of well-being in your school and to promote positive mental health and everyday interactions. So I think Tish spoke to the importance of modeling. Um, if we want our, our kids to pick up these skills, then they need to see them uh, among us as well. And um, it's, it's um, looking at, um, the everyday opportunities that you have to to promote um, to promote self care and and positive mental health and well being in your in your schools. So we'll end there and uh, and open it up to questions or discussion. Unless Tish, do you want to add anything? I think the only points on your end? the only thing I would like to add is that mm -hmm. we now know from research that teachers and other personnel in schools have a huge impact on students' well being. Huge. So those children who are at risk because they're being exposed to uh, maybe violence at home or poverty or any other kind of hardship, um, the support they get at school and the attachment they feel to their school can help them recover.
from any kind of damage mm -hmm. that's caused by trauma or by other kinds of adverse uh, experiences. Wow. <clears throat> All right, so uh, it's Kevin back in. Tish and Bonnie, thank you very much. We do have a couple of questions. Um, first off, uh, and I put it out to the field, so uh, we do record the webinars. We will post them on our website early next week. Uh, some of our attendees, Tish and Bonnie, were wondering if you, if we could, uh, if they could have access to your slide deck, and and if you're okay with that, we'll forward it to the attendees. I hope that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, one question comes from Mark Heidebrecht. Um, is the research from the CARE program regarding teachers' improved self-regulation readily available? Yes, I can um, I can connect you with the article. I can send it to you, um, and, and you can share it. Yeah, it's a, it was published in Journal of Ed Psych. That would be very helpful, so we'll make sure that gets out to the attendees as well, too. So um, just a, if we can continue the conversation, Tish and Bonnie, so um, I'll just, uh, I had the uh, pleasure, um, uh, the Ontario Principals Council invited us to a, a symposium in Ontario in November. It was principals and vice principal leadership organizations really from around the world, and the issue was uh, workplace well-being and work intensification. And so... Um, Two comments. First off, it appears to be a global issue. There was no question that that everyone was wrestling with this, um, regardless of what jurisdiction that they came to, and there seemed to be no easy answer. No one seemed to have a fix for it. I, I certainly do uh, recognize that, um, you know, your comment about uh, the, the the oxygen mask in the airplane, I think, is a good one. I think generally, um, uh, our principals and vice principals are so busy taking care of other people that sometimes we uh, neglect to take care of ourselves. And, and, and it's, a, it's, it's going, I think if we're going to move the needle on this, it's a significant cultural and leadership shift for people in our positions to be able to do that. Um, I'm curious about your thoughts about how we act, what are the drivers? How do we actually make that change? <laughs> it's a big question, I get that. Well, yeah. The, the problem, at least, you know, in the United States is, is, is a lot bigger because we also have um, uh, more and more demands coming from policymakers on schools. And there's a lot of, a lot of tension around how much money goes to schools. So uh, what we find, at least in the U.S., is that um, there's not enough time and there's not enough resources available for principals or teachers or any uh, or even superintendents to uh, apply to these problems. So this uh, the Robert Wood Johnson brief that was just published. We we presented it to some policymakers in Washington D.C. back in December with the intention of bringing this up to the policy level uh, because that I think it, it I think it has to come from the bottom up and the top down. Mm -hmm. um, at least from my experience, I would imagine it's similar here. If you don't have the support of policymakers to give you the resources you need to actually support your staff, including the principal, it's going to be it's going to be really hard. I do think we do now know what those levers are and how to proceed. It's just the resources aren't available. You know, mm -hmm. I think I think that's one of the biggest problems. It would be it would be really interesting to be able to do uh, you know some pilot work. Um, looking at infusing some of these ideas to, in, a, in a several schools to see what, what happens, you know, trying different things. Um, maybe think about that ecosystem, you know, how ecologists do that. You know, they, they try to shift the ecosystem in a way to allow it to flourish. So that's a good metaphor, I think. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I really love that graphic. I hadn't thought about those terms, right? It is an ecosystem, and it's a very sensitive ecosystem, yeah. um, mm -hmm. which can be disrupted quite easily. And often, you know, as you are, you know, alluding to, there are things uh, often beyond the control of school leaders that can upset the ecosystem. So uh, I'll talk about the context of BC right now. Um, the teachers union has been in a 15 year battle with the government around um, some contract stripping that happened. Supreme Court of Canada recently ruled. And so it's good that we're going to see more teachers in the system and supports that have been missing for a long time. However, uh, it's probably 3,000 more teachers in the system. That's more 
teachers for our members to supervise and mentor and evaluate. Um, and the, one of the unintended consequences of this is that um, teachers, principals, vice principals that have non-enrolling student services like positions as part of their assignments can no longer be in those positions. And so we have several hundred of our members who are really being displaced from work that they're they're qualified and capable and have been leading in, in very successful ways. And so, um, again, it's a good example of a policy that has come down, which initially we think eventually will be good for the system, but our, our principals and vice principals are, are carrying a significant stress load right now as they try to deal with implementing something that really was um, rushed to the field and in order to get it done before our provincial election. So, um, sorry, I'm, I'm jumping on my soapbox here. I don't, I don't intend to do that. I just, I, so what it really brings for me is, um, do, you, do you have sort of recommendations, and I know I'm putting you on the spot about sort of, you know, immediate things that people can sort of put in place to sort of calm the, the anxiety levels within their school, help them out as well in terms of, self-care and make sure that they can uh, take care of themselves in the short term as we all try to wrestle with this agreement? Well, I think the first thing I would say is teaching everybody and modeling for everybody how to take a deep breath um, and try to communicate without expressing panic and alarm because, you know, between principals and teachers, stress is also contagious. So. If a, if a leader, a school leader, is sharing something in a very stressful way, it will spread throughout the community. So doing whatever it takes to stay calm yourself as a school leader, uh, whether it means uh, taking a little time for yourself to stop and take some breath, um, whatever it takes to help you feel more calm and centered when you communicate to the rest of your community, I think that is one simple uh, not so, not easy, simple but not easy uh, first step. The other thing I just want to add is that we now know from lots of research that the school leader, in terms of the principal, uh, is critical, is a key, key person in school change and school transformation. And so the more grounded and calm and centered a principal can be, the better off the school will be. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. As we, as we, as a, a, a a support organization continue to have these conversations with our members about how we um, can ensure that their needs are taken care of. There's an interesting, uh, we're in an interesting position because we are we are part of the leadership team within districts, but we're also employees. And so there should be uh, an expectation that the district takes care of its people. And so I'm hoping whatever strategies we come up with as an association complement what's happening in districts. My fear is that um, those things aren't necessarily happening in a way that they should in districts, and really the default will be for the BCPP to take care of it. And I think we're prepared to do that. Um, get, getting back to the driver piece, I think, uh, and you raise this point, and I absolutely agree. Um, staff wellness impacts student wellness, and I think if our members are going to be able to address their own well-being in a significant way, it's with the understanding that what they do for them is good for their kids as well. The other thing that I think that we're wrestling with is that we are seeing um, our best teacher leaders in BC are not aspiring to become school leaders in a way that they once were. And it's not necessarily about compensation or benefits. Those are drivers as well, too. But it's absolutely about uh, work-life balance. And so they see principals and vice principals you know, putting out fires, uh, their work being scrutinized in a way that it hasn't been before, um, dealing with um, some pretty intense situations, and they're saying that's not for us. So I really think if we want for the sustainability of the system, if we want to make sure our best teacher leaders are aspiring to do this work, we have to demonstrate to them that we do have some workplace well-being and we do have some work-life balance. Easier said than done, but I think if we're going to give ourselves permission to do that, those are the reasons why we would want to um, move this agenda forward. Mm -hmm. Couldn't have said it better. Thank you. So um, uh, on that note, we're coming to the end of our time. Um, Bonnie and Tish, I want to thank you so much. This is You packed a lot of really valuable information in, in a very short presentation and given us a lot more to think about as school leaders about how we support our staff, particularly in this stretch 
uh, between uh, for the next couple of months. I would always argue that um, the beginning of May is really the halfway point in the school year. There's as much to do in the last two months as there were in the first eight. And so it can be a stressful time for teachers and for school leaders out there. And I think you've given us some lots of things to think about as we move forward. I also want to say we, we, we want to continue the conversation with you about how we can work together to better support school leaders. And I really uh, appreciated our initial conversation with that, in, that, uh, in that area. And I look forward to us continuing to work together. So thank you, so, thank you so much for your time today and really presenting something of great value to our association. Um, and for our attendees, I'm going to bring our to a close. And thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you. Thank you.